Like, look, you know who Ricardo Laborio is, right? Yeah, Jiu-Jitsu Black Belt. Yeah, he's actually the guy that founded American Top Team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, right. Coconut uh, Clearwater? Co he, he, was a co he was in Coconut Creek, but he moves to Orlando now. He broke okay. away from American Top Team, and he started his own uh, his own program. Um, oh, I didn't know that. But, uh, but so, I mean, they, they're trying to break out of it, but for some reason they're trying to bring in – keep with them these bad traditions so they yeah. can call their school traditional. But I'm a traditional school. I mean, I wear my gi pants like 99% of the time, you know? I never, you know, I'm a, I'm a karate guy from like, um, that's all I am. I'm a karate guy. I don't even know anything else. Yeah. But, but I know that a kata, I love pop locking, right? I mean, yeah. I could pop, I pop, that's one of the things I do and I love it. But I also love kata. I would have never also, guessed, man. <laughs> oh, I love kata. I love pop locking. But I also love katas. But I don't think either one belongs in a in a martial arts curriculum. I think they're both fun to do and fun to watch. But I don't think when you're teaching self defense, which karate should be, mm -hmm. I don't think it belongs in that curriculum because you're misleading people by saying those kind of techniques. Uh, are going to be effective if somebody jumps you in the street. So I love pop locking. I love katas, but neither belongs in, in, in a martial artist core curriculum. Yeah, I'm a little different when I look at it. Um, when I started, I started in a, a Kempo based karate school, actually, which is pretty cool because it really, one thing I did enjoy about it was my instructor, Lee Barden. He was my instructor. I don't know if you ever met him or not or whatever, but he, he's a nunchuck guy. That's what he was known for back in the day. But uh, he came from, like, this Kempo background, and he was very big about, like, being open to other arts. He was like, you know, learn. If it works, it works, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and then we never did katas. All we did was spar. He was like, you use the technique. You'll do your training, uh, doing your technique. Make sure your technique's good. We'll do the mitt work. As soon as we're done with that, then we'll spar, and we'll apply. Or we'll do, like, one-step sparring, that kind of stuff. Or we'll hit the bag. But we never did katas. I didn't actually learn a kata, a one kata, until I was, like, in my – like 25 or something like that was the first time I ever had to because the sport martial arts team that I was on, the owner of the team, the guy who paid all of our bills, he was like, all right, everybody who's on this team, you're doing three divisions. I don't care. Whatever tournament we go to, you're doing three. And like, of course, most, most tournaments, you could do point fighting, you could do continuous kickboxing, but then you had to pick another one. And I was like, well, shit, the only one left is God, I don't want to do that. So I had to learn it because we were on an international stage and I don't want to look like a jackass, which I always did because I was terrible at it. But um, I compare kata to shadow boxing. When I shadow box, unless, although with shadow boxing, it's not like a constricted thing, right? Shadow boxing, I free flow. I can work on my hands. I can move around. I can work on whatever it is I want to work on. But I'm still punching and kicking the air. Well, with katas, you're still just punching and kicking the air. The only difference is one's rigid and one's not. So to me, uh, kata is like shadow boxing. I think the biggest difference between shadow boxing, and, and I hear people saying, well, it's like shadow boxing. Well, no, because there there's certain rules you have to go in different directions, x amount of steps, depending yeah, on the tournament you got. Yeah. But but to me, the difference is when you put your hands in these weird positions that have absolutely <laughs> nothing to I'm do. Not, yeah, I'm not saying the actual techniques will apply, right. right? But I'm just saying the idea of kicking a punch in the air. I mean, I, I think shadow boxing is more like warming up and and cooling down, and I think katas to me. In my gym, they're more like drills because they're you do this, 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 and then they do this, this, this. So they're a little more pre-framed, and you want to build that kind of stuff in your muscle memory, like four punches and sprawl, four punches yeah. and sprawl. Then when you're punching someone and they go for your takedown, you're in your muscle memory because you can't think of it then. Yeah. But I don't want this to be in any of my students' muscle memory <laughs> if they get attacked. Yeah, the, the technique so, itself, now that's, that's yeah. different, <laughs> you know, but so, like um, – uh, well, let me see here. Um, just like food for thought, you know, when it comes to like katas and stuff like that. Personally, when I was doing sport karate tournaments, you had kata guys and you had fighters. And whenever you went to a sport karate tournament, the kata guys did katas, the fighters did fighting. And there was a reason it's because kata guys were very used to that rigid, that uh, rigid structure, right? But then, like, if you go look at like the WKF style karate, they have these divisions called bunkai divisions. And when you're doing the bunkai, it's just the application of and the interesting thing is, is, like, you get, like, guys who do application of katas, right? 
and their application might be completely different than someone else's because it's interpretive. You know what I'm saying? It's, so, it's subjective. The word bunkai yeah. to me is, is the craziest word. It's like, it's like if you're cheating on your wife and then <laughs> she, she catches you and you say, no, there's bunkai. In reality, I was training for you, so I, was, <laughs> I wanted to be better for you. Bunkai means you can do any stupid thing and then explain it away with your own with your own <laughs> subjective rhetoric. So yeah. Boon, when when people like karate guys come up to me and they try to argue with me about kata or yeah. keeping your hand here, and then they use the word bunkai, and I know what I it, what it means is lie about it, it and explain it. Yeah, make up make any it up. shit you want and just yeah. say, well, that's the reason we do that. You might yeah. have a guy coming in from from a helicopter repelling, and you have to block that. <laughs> and then you have a guy, you know, so it's just, just the, the word bunkai gives them a license to lie. Yeah. It's, a, it's a license to lie. Uh, there, yeah, yeah. there you go. <laughs> That's but a great anyway. explanation. Because, like, it is true that every time I've seen somebody talk about the application of kata, it's always different. And it's I've even crazy. heard this theory. I've heard this theory, which made a lot of sense, right? So the theory was is that, like, a lot of our martial arts that come from, like, Japan, we right. didn't actually really learn until we were in war with Japan, right? So we go over there. We're like, hey, we start having our, our local guys go in there and start learning the traditional stuff. And, like, of course, they're not going to show us the good stuff because we're The good stuff. Come. Yeah, yeah. So they're like, all right, well, let's hide. Let's disguise stuff, right? <laughs> and that's how it was explained to me is, like, when they showed katas to Americans, they were much different like, when they – They were laughing. They were laughing. Yeah, they were laughing. Oh, my God. That's a good one. I thought of it a different way. I see we think a lot we think a lot alike. But my my thing was I like yours better. I'm gonna start using that. <laughs> my thing was in the old warlord days, they were real because they were yeah. testing their stuff. Like Kaju Kempo, the system that I got my black belt in, and I'm from Honolulu, Hawaii, where they hate whites. I don't know if you know that or not. So I was practicing my stuff all the time. So I'd learn some techniques that's in, in my in my gym from my instructor who spent 25 years in prison in and out. Then I'd go to school and I'd get to practice the stuff I learned. I'd go, well, that works or that doesn't. And then in the old days in Japan, they learned all those techniques and they, and they, and they made them work. But then when, when we became an industrialized world, right? And then we yeah. didn't have to practice our stuff all the time. There weren't people with swords walking around all the time or guns. It wasn't the old, you know, the old West. So there was nothing anymore. So karate school guys were like, shit, man, there's no, nothing going on. I can't, they can't practice stuff. Let's make up a bunch of cool, crazy shit. And then guys will come in and we'll tell them that it'll do this and this and this. They'll yeah. never find out because they won't ever try it. It's like when you're cheating on your wife and you know she'll never look in your phone because she doesn't have your phone, uh, your password. My wife, by the way, has every password I've ever had. <laughs> and the problem is I don't have hers. And I don't care. I don't. I don't think about the cheating <laughs> thing. But I want her bank password. Nah. <laughs> but anyway. But anyway. So then hey, you got the fail safe at that point. You got the fail safe. I don't need the one. Hey, we're oh, I'm sorry. She's yelling at me from the other. <laughs> but anyway, so that's where I thought it came. But I like your way. A lot. I thought I like your r rationale a lot better. And that's what they did. They fooled us. Yeah, I think I think it was a lot of that. I think that they did lie a lot. And I think it was because, like, for, for instance. If anybody's ever been to Japan, like, um, the thing is, is like a lot, I'm not saying every Japanese person is racist, but I'm saying a lot of Japanese are very racist. They're very racist against the Chinese, especially they're very racist. against. They're homogeneous. People. They're homogeneous. Yeah. yeah they, they, they just they like their own culture. Yeah. They, they, they like to keep their thing to themselves, which, you know, it is what it is. It's their culture. I can't down them for their culture. Right. I'm not going to project my own beliefs onto their shit because that's an American thing to do. Right. So like, I'm not going to do that. But at the same time, you have to think, like, who in their right mind would just be, like, giving up their, their whole art, their whole life to people they've never met? You know what I'm saying? Like, like we show up with our tanks and we pull out our gun and go, teach me karate, bitch, or I'll kill you. And you go, okay. Like, no, they're not going to keep your hand you. here. Keep your <laughs> hand here. You know how many people I've left hooked in my, in my, in my whole life? Dude. I've, I've left to so many people because <laughs> their hand's here. So, they don't, you know what I'd like? 
when, when I get the opportunity, when I get my studio up, this is actually one of the last ones I'm going to do live on Instagram. Although I love Instagram's format because it's so casual. It doesn't feel so serious. It's able, I, I feel like people are can relax this way. Um, but I'm about to switch everything up to a studio so I can do things a little different. But I would love, love, love to have like you. And I don't know if you know who Jesse Encamp is. Yeah, the karate I guy. Love, yes, I'd love for you guys to debate that because I think it'd be very good conversation. Because they call it, they call it Hitake. No, that's a new hitake. One. Oh, Hitake. Yeah, when hitake you bring it here, they call it Hitake. And you have to do it. For pulling. Pulling. But then why yeah. do they keep it here? Why wouldn't, wouldn't you keep it out here so you can actually pull? But they actually leave it here when they're sparring, and they just keep getting knocked out. And it's <laughs> yeah. a terrible habit. I have and it's their muscle lot. memory. You know, it's very odd because I've seen uh, – even Olympic style karate, like which, which it kind of makes a little bit of sense and it doesn't, like because if you look at Kyokushin karate, right? Kyokushin karate guys, they keep their fucking hands up, right? They keep their hands up, they're ready to go, but they don't they don't punch to the face, they punch to full full contact, right? But they can kick to the head, but they keep their hands up anyway, right? Because they won't. Not they enough. Won't. Not enough. Yeah. And, uh, not enough. But I, not enough because I don't like Kyosh. I love Kyokushin, and I actually went to. Uh, uh, I actually went to Japan and stayed at Kenji Kurosaki, Sensei Kurosaki's house, who's, who brought Kyoshi Shin to, uh, he actually brought it to um, Holland, and that's where the Dutch started doing kickboxing. He mixed yes, the yes. two. That's why so many Kyoshi Shin guys got into K1, like Andy Hoog and, and guys like that. But anyway, um, they don't do it enough because to me, you should, even when we just drill, I always have our guys at least jab to the face um, because I want my people to always keep their hands up. But when the, yeah. when ninety nine percent of the techniques they're just trying to hit each other in the body, Which then all of a sudden the up. kick comes up. I think their hands are down here too much. I yeah. think they should not only kick uh, kick be able to kick to the face. I think they should be able to just jab like they can. You know, just I want them to keep their hands up more. They keep their hands down too much. That's why they get caught with those bop, 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 bop. But then all of a sudden, a high kick comes yeah. in. And I don't I like think... the fact that. I don't like that because, to me, they're always going to be hurt. And they get kicked in the leg all the time. And I don't like that kind of a uh, yeah, – I don't know. To me, it doesn't yeah. translate. In the street, yeah. that's not going to happen. Well, yeah, I think punching – But it's a tough It's a tough punch. art. It's yeah, a tough like, damn tough. art. Those are tough guys, man. They have great body condition tough and stuff like shit. that. If you can make it <laughs> – you know, Kur like Kensei, Sensei your Kurosaki was this hardcore Japanese guy, hey. and he took me in. He actually took me into his home and let me stay there and train me to Kyoshi Shin and but he and some kickboxing, and uh, he was a great guy. And I love their toughness. Yeah, I just don't like that style. Do you ever watch? Yeah. You ever watch them compete? Yeah, yeah, it's some I brutal mean, they, shit. They, yeah, they hit. Oh fucking hard and it's like a lot of it's uh very traditional in the way that they talk makiwara about, like, they love yeah, the, yeah, makiwara. the makiwara boards. and, I, and yeah. i'm a makiwara fanatic <laughs> like, i'm a makiwara fanatic this fanatic. dude had a good idea this dude said why not make open hand slaps to the face legal for it like i don't know if you watch combat jiu-jitsu but i just got back from ebi and combat jiu-jitsu is jiu-jitsu but with open hand slapping and they were hitting the shit out of each other but that's not a bad idea it's like a step up it's not a good idea. I'll what? tell you why. I'll what? tell you why. No, it's a great idea. But then why not just have punches? I, the <laughs> reason is, the reason it's not a good idea is because, I mean, I just fought like, you know, just regular. I always did. So it's a fine for me. But a lot of people, a lot of guys, and not even wimpy guys or anything, like at our gym, right, a lot of people go straight to jujitsu, you know, mm -hmm. it's a different course. And, and they're training for jujitsu, and they say, you know, it's like they're training for a fight. And just like point fighter karate is trained for a fight, they thought they were trained for a fight. People do not like to get punched in the face or mm. hit in the face. People don't want to get hit in the face. Mm. But but maybe the slapping might be okay. I mean, I'm just saying it's a step up. It's something. Yeah. <laughs> At least they're not getting, because people don't like to get punched in the face. That's why point fighting karate was so big when I was coming up. People didn't want to come in the kickboxing. It was like me and one other guy training kickboxing, and everybody else Dude. in that gym was point fighting. Now it's yeah. jujitsu. Everybody wants to do BJJ because rolling is great, 
but you don't get punched in the <laughs> face. You know, it's funny. You, you were talking about, like, everybody was doing uh, point fighting and not kickboxing. Because even when I was on a sport martial arts team and we traveled, kickboxing divisions were everywhere. You could do kickboxing divisions. They were there. But yeah. it, it was messed up because you couldn't get paid. So, like, all the guys who were winning these point fighting tournaments, they'd get five grand, ten grand for their fights or whatever. But then for winning, because you didn't get anything if you didn't win. Uh, but yeah. uh, I'd win kickboxing tournaments over and over and over again in these divisions, and I didn't get paid a damn thing. I got paid nothing. Yeah. I was like, what the fuck? I did all the work. These guys are playing tag. I, I, I get the hell beat out of me for, like, all, like, what was it? Let's see here. It was like, oh, sometimes it was two two-minute rounds for the tournament-style kickboxing. And then, like, I had to fight, like, eight or nine dudes. And then sometimes it was double elimination. So I might have a tough fight and then have to see that same dude again at the end. Like, damn it. Why? And then have to fight him again. And we didn't get paid a damn thing. I remember the first time I got paid. Yeah. The first and time they were I got getting paid. paid. The first time I got paid was uh, in New York. It was the first international turn. International was a national. The first international tournament I, I won. And I wind up, like, winning easily, right? It was the easiest tournament I ever fought. And I won, like, 100 bucks. Meanwhile, other guys in our tournament were winning 1000 2000 3000 bucks. I was so like, why don't you money? go to K1 or K or WK? Why don't you just translate or transfer over to that? Oh, that's because I'm mediocre. I was mediocre as hell. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't want to go pro because I, I wasn't that good. You know, yeah. like, I was okay. And I, I, I knew because um, when I was doing my full contact stuff, I was 6-0 amateur boxer. And I was like, okay, well, now let's – I already know karate. I've done boxing now. Let's move up. Let's go to something that I think would suit me. So I did kickboxing. And then I was 4-0 and for full contact kickboxing. And then I took two losses back-to-back to, back to the exact same shot, spinning back kick to the liver. Two, two losses to completely different cities, took two losses to the same thing. And the first loss was my ego. I know it was because I was winning. Round one opened up, bow, bow, bow. He turned his back and started walking towards the corner. I was like, Shh. I'm just going to walk over there, and I'm going to, like, crack him one more time, and it should be done because he was, like, disengaging. So I ran over there. He looked over his shoulder and got scared and threw the kick and hit me in the liver and dropped him. And I couldn't recover after that. I was like, fuck. And, like, that was my ego because I rushed in, and it was fresh. It was still the first 15 seconds. And then the second fight, I was in Miami, and that dude just beat the shit out of me. He, he was just simply better than me. He was beating my ass, and then I covered up real high and he was doing it on purpose he was getting my hands real high as soon as he got my hands high like he jumped spinning back kick to the liver and i thought he broke my rib because of how how it felt it was a delayed effect too because he got me and i was like oh i'm gonna fucking get you oh god i just fell it's the first breath yeah it sucked it sucked and i tried to get up and i couldn't i was like this is the first time i've never been able to get up and at this point i've been fighting for years and i was like damn son I was like, I, I got me. He's just better than me. And then at that moment, I realized I was like, you know what? Like, I don't think that the caliber of fighters that I'm fighting right now are even the best in the world, but they're best than me. And I was like, maybe it's just my time to go a different path. But I never take it back for anything. I love the losses because they teach you so much. I love fighting. I still do. And I'll still fight pretty much any time I get the opportunity. But at the same time, professionally, it just wasn't in the cards for me. Yeah. Um you remember Benny the Jet? Oh, okay. yeah, dude. And champ. Okay. Great. Undefeated, so he, right? Undefeated? Yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't know if he really was, but I, he was my he was my trainer. And his spinning back kick was it, – it hurt so much. And he would spar with us because we had – he had fights coming up. So his team was like his sparring partners. Um, and uh, and it, his spinning back kick was the best ever. Benny the Jet had the best thing back kick ever, um, and it was it hurt so much. And then then I fought uh, Charlie Archie, and he he hit me with a liver shot, and I I I just I remember being there on the ground just like thinking I can't even breathe. I couldn't. I, and then so I I fought him again, and I remember the whole training camp. I was having nightmares. I was like waking up and shit. I just did not want to fight him again, but I had to. <laughs> And That's I just kept terrible. thinking of that one liver shot over oh, and over and over. People, if, so. if, if anybody who's watching or listening, even later on, like after this uh, is up, if you've never been hit with a, a really solid liver shot that drops you, it is the most unique feeling of pain I've ever had. Because when I got hit, I don't know about you, but there was a, a slight delay. So I got yeah, hit. Because you right? breathe. It's I'm your like, first breath. Oh. Yeah, I'm like, 
I think I'm okay. And then I go to go back. And as soon as I took that first step, my whole body would just collapse. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm dying. Yeah. <laughs> you bastard. But, <laughs> but it's, the, it's the breath. It's a, um, like it's the first breath because the breath, uh, when you breathe, your diaphragm touches your liver and it's already bruised. And that's when you, that's when you go down. So when you get hit, boom, and then you go, oh, it's the first <laughs> breath. Like, yeah, you just it, it paralyzes you but and you you're like, it's like you're you're paralyzed and you can faint, but you just can't move. And it's like, when you're knocked out, you're knocked out. And you don't even know. But when you're yeah. hit in the liver like that, you want it. Like when Oscar De La Hoya was hit by Bernard Hopkins, he was actually trying to pull himself up by the rope, you know, in, in the r boxing ring, and he couldn't. It hurts that much. It's, it's, it's bad. Painful. It's really bad. And it, yeah. I, to me, it messed with my head because I remember laying there, like, holding my side, not letting go, going, You've been hit way fucking harder than this. I was like, get up. And I'm telling myself, like, get up. Just get up. And I could not do it. And I was like, There's, I'm like, I really did. I thought, like, he cracked, broke my rib. Because, like, the, I had never felt that kind of pain before. And I was like, that's the only thing I could compare it to. I was like, I've had a broken rib before. But I was like, this is really low. I was like, that's odd. Because when I had a broken rib, it was, like, up here at the top of the rib cage, Like, right here at the little point, whatever the hell that is. But then I, like, I couldn't. It's, it's a hell of a thing, man. Anybody who's never experienced a liver shot, Try, try it. Try it. Go out there. We have a, we have a, the, at the pit, we have a little game and this, this might not be for everyone, but sometimes I don't want the guys to, to hit that hard in the face. So I have them just put their heads together. Like they're glued their foreheads together. And the game is called find the liver. <laughs> and, like and, I'll tell you, and I'll tell you what's funny. I mean, this isn't funny, but it's funny. I mean, so they're going, going, then all of a sudden, there's a class full of guys doing that. Then all of a sudden you go, oh, you'll hear, first you'll hear like, Hurr! and then you look, and there's one guy that will always drop to one, this usually he'll just drop to one knee, and then uh -huh. you know, you can always see, you can't fake that. No. So it's, and then we, and then I laugh, and then we, it's, it's not funny. I don't even know why I think <laughs> that's funny. funny. But yeah. hey, is that McJojo-ish? Is that, no, uh, is that my McJojo not, coming you know, out? I don't know if you like Cause like you, I remember you telling me, uh, you were like, you better not put any of my damn videos on your page. <laughs> but like the thing is, it's like, I wouldn't mostly unless unless you. Did you see one the one I sent you with my with my stepsons hitting the bag? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, like I have five rules. So like my five rules are really simple. Don't teach no touch knockouts. That's simple. Don't molest kids. That's simple. You know, don't uh, rip people off for their money, like shady business practices, like knocking on people's door for tuition money. Like, that's shady. Um, don't lie about your, your belt rank or your fight record. Don't lie about that because people had to fight for that, and they earned that number. And if you didn't earn it, fuck you. You're, like, you're diminishing what it really means. And then the last one is, uh, like, unsafe training practices, which is, like, to me, unsafe training practices, people say there's a fine line, but there's really not. You don't go outside on the concrete with shoes on and full contact spar – as hard as you can with no headgear because somebody gets knocked out and they hit their head, they're going to die. Or you don't line your students up and then crack them as hard as you can in the face like I've seen in so many videos because you're not helping them. You're only creating these concussions, right? So those are unsafe. Or even worse, I've seen this one where dude man will have like a stick, right? And whenever his students will mess up, he'll just hit them as hard as he can to like as a correction. It's like that's not helping them. You're just being a dick. You know, like you could correct them without cracking them in the face with a stick, you know? So those are my five Let me rules. just say, so let me tell you. I'll tell you what breaks that rule for me is like training guys like Chuck Liddell, Glover Tick, Sarah, Court McGee. Can you imagine if I just whacked them in the face and slapped them and shit? I know they respect me a lot and they treat me really good, but I don't think that would fly. I think like if I whacked them and called them a, I think I'd be like between just the guys I've trained. I think if I did that, I think I'd be dead right now. <laughs> yeah. Like, and most people with common sense would hit you back. They you would. know what I'm saying? And you but have a good – we have, we think a lot alike. My my one thing, I just have kind of a one thing. It's broad. Um, I don't like the sparring anymore. We don't do sparring like we used to. Um, but my one thing that bothers me the most and why I speak out the most, I do so many videos on, you know, phony martial arts and this and this and shit like that is – it really bothers me because these people are paying them good money to, and, and they're giving them their faith. Like if you went to the doctor, you know, and you're giving him your money to save your life. I'm giving, 
you're giving they're giving me my their money mm -hmm. to protect their life to protect their kids life to protect their kids at school and not get bullied and or if it's an adult to protect his life if he's walking down the street um if somebody attacks him i'm not going to teach him to do something that will get him killed to me that's mm -hmm. a disservice and you're going to get your person killed and then it, it, that kills me that that people do that so i want more than anything i want my students um, to be safe on the street. I want to teach them if they get attacked, I'm going to teach them the right stuff. And that's, mm. to me, that's my biggest uh, pet peeve. So I teach them that stuff. Yeah. And I might go a little overboard, but I'd rather go a little overboard and they end up in court than I go a little underboard and they end up in a fucking nursing home being turned yeah. every four hours by a Filipino nurse mm. and with a tracheostomy tube. Yeah. I don't it's want, a... I don't want that. You know, it's one of those things where, like, I think that as martial arts instructors, coaches, whatever your title is, sensei, sifu, I don't really care, honestly. But whatever your title is, I think it's our job. Like, we chose the job. We could have done anything. I could be a fucking mechanic, right? But I didn't chose to do that. I chose to be a martial arts instructor. And whenever you step out on that mat, you have a service to your students to teach them something that you and your heart knows will help them. Whatever yeah. it is. Shit, if I'm teaching them how to do fucking push-ups today then that's what we're doing, and we're going to do push-ups all goddamn class, then I'm going to teach them the best fucking push-up I can. What I'm not going to do is project my own laziness on them and go, you know what? I mean, we could do push-ups all the way in the right way, but you know what? Fuck that. Let's half, let's just halfway do it. You know, well, if you do that with everything else, right, it starts with a push-up. Next thing you know, you're teaching them how to do a lazy jab. Next thing you know, you're teaching them how to knock people out with your mind like George Dillman. You know, it's because that laziness, it just starts to, like, infest everything else that you do. Unfortunately, this is not a job you can afford to be lazy, ever. Mm. Because yeah. if, you're a, if you're an instructor, right, one, your students are always gunning for you. They are. You're good students anyway. They're always wanting to be like you. They're wanting to emulate you. Beat you, know, you up. Beat you up, right? And the higher not... your belt gets, no matter where you go, the bigger a target you have on your back. So luckily, with a lot of good arts, you constantly have to prove it. You know, like even, like, for instance, Freddie Roach, right? Freddie Roach phenomenal boxing instructor, right? He personally cannot box right now anymore because, you know, the Parkinson's and stuff like that. But he can teach you how to be a great instructor. He can teach you how to be a great fighter. And that's an important skill to have, even though he can't do it. And that's the cool thing about being an instructor is eventually once we get too old or too beaten up, you know, or like injured, you know, it's okay to, to turn that switch and go, you know what? It's time for me to maybe pass the torch on some of this to you guys so you guys can help the next generation. But I'm still going to teach you the best I can based off of my personal experiences. I'm not going to just make shit up. You know what I'm saying? And that's where a lot of the instructors fail. They get to a point where, like, I can't fight anymore, so what can I do to keep up? Don't. Don't fucking keep up. Be honest with your students. Like, hey, man, I can't spar right now, but there's nothing wrong with that. But I'm going to teach you how to be the best you can be. I'm going to make you the best. I'm going to give you the training tips that I wish I had so I don't get hurt or you don't get hurt. You know, shit. If I, like, first of all, I met Bill Wallace when I was a kid, right? And the, Bill Wallace is probably one of my favorite human beings ever because he tells me like it is, like to my face. He called me a faggot the first time I ever met him. <laughs> he, goes, he goes, I walked up and I was dressed like a uh, gothic, right? And I walked up and uh, my instructor introduced me. And he goes, hey, man, I want to introduce you to somebody. And I knew who this was because, of course, it's Bill Wallace. He goes, I want to introduce you to Bill Wallace. And I geeked out. I, I geeked out a lot. I'm like, oh, my God. I love watching your kickboxing matches. I think you – I love your style. I love that one-legged type style. It's working for you. Um, and he goes, hey, can I talk to you for a second? And I was like, oh, he's going to give me some advice. And he walks me over to the side of the mat and he goes, why are you dressed like a faggot? <laughs> he goes, stop it. And then we walked away. And then since that day, one, I, I, I changed how I dressed because I, I was realizing how – how silly I was looking. But then two, um, I respected him because he was not afraid to just say what was on his mind. And I think that that's a good a quality as an, for an instructor is to not hold back on what your thoughts are. Just let him out. If you feel really feel that way, just tell him, you know? But, yeah. you know, I, I, I feel that way, but my <laughs> wife doesn't because sometimes, like, if somebody does something in my class, mainly my adult class, not so much my yeah. kids, but he does something and I'll say, and they'll say, oh, that hurt. You know, I got this. And, you know, like, oh, I, I got a cramp. I go, you need a fucking Midol and a tampon? Hit the fucking bag. And so that's, I mean, I can get away with that in my adult class. Like, if they're not hitting it, I'm saying, hit the bag as hard as you can. And I go, I watch, I watch, you know, I go around and watch. I go, 
No, I actually said hit it as fucking hard as you can, not as soft as you can. You know, yeah. so, so it's like little, it's like we want to, I want to push my guys and I want to have that attitude. Like, you ever see that Church Street boxing guy that you like was mocking all his, all his fighters? Well, they weren't fighters. They, were, they would go from like Wall Street to do cardio boxing and he would call them little bitches and he would yell at them. <laughs> check him. Check him out. It's like Church Street Boxing something. I definitely will check that out. He doesn't do that anymore, but I, I he was really funny. So I, I'm kind of, I take a little of that, and I've always done it, but so I kind of dog my guys a little here and there because I want to build them here without bringing them down. Yeah. But then, I mean, so I train guys from cops to – my toughest guy right now in my gym, sparring-wise, um, is a pediatrician. He's a pediatrician and he loves to spar. I mean, that's beside my fight team. From working with them kids. <laughs> he loves to, but that's not my, my fight team is separate. You know, of yeah. course he's not going to, you know, like Chuck and glow, you know, but yeah. for my, for my, for my traditional students that wear belt, you know, we wear a belt and a gi and everything. Um, it's a pediatrician. So we, you know, we go, I push them, but I, I don't want to push them where they don't want to come anymore. And I don't feel like sparring like we used to spar. I mean, I have video of Chuck's black belt test, and there was blood everywhere, both of ours. But we, I don't think that's necessary anymore. Just like I don't think cops should practice with real rounds. Um, I, don't think, I don't think military should do war games with real bullets. I think you can I, – I, I've come to the point where I used to feel like that. Um, in fact, Cecil People saw my first green belt test that I gave to my, my students, my first green belt test, there was so much blood and beating. He said, you're never going to run a school if you do that. And you're going to end up in prison. Because then my gym was in my backyard. And see, you know, Cecil Peoples. Yeah. He's the, uh, anyway, I was his roommate for a while. But anyway, <laughs> um, and he said, you, you're never going to survive, you know, teaching. That's not, you can't do that. But I was like, no, it has to be real. It has to be like yeah. realistic. I, mean, I want to be the, the pit, the pit, you know. <laughs> yeah, there's. There's times for that. There's a line. And there's times, but then if it's like that all the time, it's kind of like hitting a heavy bag as hard as you can every time you hit the heavy bag. You know, yeah. you don't you don't realize like if you do that every time, you're you're, you're damaging yourself a little bit. You know, like or yeah. you got to pick and choose the shots. It's like training you hard every hard. day. Yeah, exactly. It's like training hard every day. Fighter, you can't train your even your fight team if they train hard every day, they'll just get burnt out. Yeah, they got nothing left. You know. Yeah. Uh, that's okay. right. Now, somebody did ask a good question. They wanted to know if Chuck was training for you for this coming up fight. Um, hold on a sec. Babe, can you get coffee, please? Thanks. Um, I wish I had that right now. I, I'm out. I know. I get, I drink, I've been doing Bulletproof, and that's, it, it, it's the best thing I've, I've ever done in my diet. This is the best change I've ever made to my diet. Two things. Number one, intermittent fasting every day. I've never felt better. And number two, Bulletproof coffee. Um, but, uh, we talked. He knows how I feel about him fighting again. I'm, I, I'm against it, um, but he's asked me to work with him and, and work his corner. And I'm, uh, we're like, you know, we're not like friends. We're like family. Like, so we don't yeah. hang out together. We never did because he does his things. I do mine. But we would do like, you know, Christmas, Thanksgiving, and we're like, we're like, he's like my younger brother. Uh, people say, people say, son. And that kind of irritates me because he's only like 10 years younger. <laughs> but people actually say, oh, you look like Chuck's dad. I go, he's fucking 10 years younger than me. Shut the fuck up. He's well, 10 it, years younger. You know, it probably it's probably because you're his, his trainer, you know. Yeah. So people just assume that, you know, you might be older or whatever. Like but that, we are right? going to work. We are going to work. Too. He's asked me to work his corner. So. so are you, I mean, you know, obviously, you, if you, I think you get put in this uh, awkward position with stuff like that because – as trainers, sometimes you get people who want to fight, and it, you know it's not what you feel would be best for them, but they're going to do it anyway. Yeah, so it's almost like you. I want to like, be there. To, yeah, to you got to be there for them, even if it's a decision you you might not necessarily like. But I think that it's awesome that you're willing to like still work with him and help him get better, even though maybe it's not necessarily the decision that you would hope for. You know. Yeah, I, I think he should be done. I think he's done. Um, he should have been done just just because I don't like my guys. I'm not a fight fan. And I don't like sport fighting that much. And mm -hmm. I didn't growing up. I just had to do it because that's all I've ever done in my whole life. So yeah. it just came like 
I don't like brushing my teeth either, but I do it every day. So <laughs> fighting, fighting to me is like something I've always done gr the way I grew up. And then I it just kind of, I, and I didn't like it. I never really liked it. And then, uh, thank you. But then, uh, but the same, same, like same with this, you know, I, I, I don't like guys fighting. I wish Glover and Cord and Chuck and all my students just trained with me. We just had fun training and we go, you know, just like the old days. But yeah. they want to fight, so I have to, you know, I do that. I wrap their hands. I make sure I wrap their hands. Yeah. And, and they and they go in the ring, and and it makes me really stressed out because I don't want them to get hurt, and I don't like to see them hurting someone else either. To be honest. Yeah. Uh, of course, it's... I'd rather them win, but so it's a whole. <laughs> I go through a whole like mental issue, and I get stressed, and even my fighters know that I'm more stressed out than they are. Mm. But so with Chuck, it's like he's like a he's like a, a little brother to me. So when I see him, if when he gets hit, it's like, oh, I don't even want to watch, but I have to, because then when he comes yeah. back to the corner, I have to try to give him good advice. So anyway, that's how it is with that. Yeah, man. Well, that I think it's cool that you're still, you know, you're still working with him and stuff like that. And you know, I wish him nothing but the best of luck for his fight. Um, Such you know, a good guy. Well. People, um, I got so many stories about Chuck. If people realize, like, just the kind of guy Chuck was, it's like. Mm -hmm. Chuck is. It's, it's such a weird thing because he's like, people don't realize what a good guy Chuck is. It's like yeah, what a good awesome. family man yeah. and shit. Yeah, it's it's funny because like a lot of his Instagram and stuff like that is, uh, you know, it is pictures of him out with his family and stuff, which is great. And, you know, it's always very interesting when you see people on their Instagram because you, you always portray on your social media what you want people to see. It might not necessarily be who you are, but you always portray what you want people to see about you. Because that's why you put it out there. Like, hey, this is something that I am interested in. Or this is my thought. Or this is what I want you to see. Because I worked out. And now you get to see me work out. Or people who don't work out, you don't get to see their body because they only do their head. You know, so you only get to see what they want you to see. But it's really cool when you see people who are family. Um, like Kenny yeah. Florian. I, I interviewed Kenny Florian the other day. And yeah. he's, he, he's posting pictures of his baby. And he's posting pictures with his wife and stuff like that. And then you have people who don't do that shit ever. You, you never, like, because I don't post pictures of certain things because people actually want to hurt me, <laughs> you know? So you don't get everything. You get bits and pieces, right? But, you know, with people like that, you know, it's really cool for them to say, hey, man, like, I love my family. I love my baby. I love this about my life. And they're just happy, you know, good, happy people. <laughs> do, you do, do you do the, have you ever done the Super Show? I tried to do it this last year. Well, two times, so. The first time I got invited to the Super Show was before I actually had McDojo Life. And uh, Century did an article, a two-page article on me about how I started the martial arts. And it was about inspiring people and stuff like that. And I started the martial arts because I was born with a cleft palate, and it left me with scars and stuff like that. Well, as a kid, I got picked on and beat up like every day in school. And that happened all the way until I got put in the hospital by a group of kids in middle school. And they beat me for like five minutes. They stabbed me with pencils. They stepped on my head. They hurt me real bad. Um, and two teachers stood there and watched the whole thing and didn't do anything about it. Well, my mom gave me karate lessons uh, for my birthday after that, and I never stopped. Fucking love it. I love it. And I couldn't find a fight. I couldn't even pick a fight after that. I didn't let anybody know I did karate. I kept it to myself. But, like, my mentality had changed. I was no longer a victim. I was like, hey, if you want to go, let's go. Now I actually know what I'm doing, so <laughs> we'll go if you want, right? But I couldn't find a fight. And uh, so Century did a write-up on that, and they invited me to come out. They said, well, just, I'll have you come out. But at the time, I couldn't afford tickets, or not their tickets, because they were going to let me there for free. I just couldn't afford the plane tickets to go and the hotel. So I, I, I didn't go that year. And then this last year, I wanted to go, but I, they were like, hey, we just want information, because I wanted press passes to cover it. They were like, we want information about your thing. Well, they didn't know that I did, like, serious interviews like this or, like, I want people to, like, bring up the good in martial arts, and I want to get rid of the bad shit. Well, they didn't know that. All they saw was, like, my feed. So when they looked on the feed, the, all they saw was me making fun of these crappy martial arts. And they were like, we don't think that you – we believe in your views. We won't have you there this year. <laughs> but they have Master Ken. Well, I think the difference is because Master Ken's a parody. Like, he calls things bullshit out of fun, and I actually legitimately call things bullshit. <laughs> like – you know, yeah, so, he does it in a, so. yeah, he does it in a, in a pretty, seems like he's, yeah, it seems pretty real to me when he does it. It seems like, <laughs> yeah, yeah it's pretty, but what, we'll see. I'm going to try again this next year because I really do 
want to expand. Like I do yeah. want people to know about legitimate martial let arts. Let me let me put a word in because I'm really close with them. I yeah, I, I, I've I, done I every go. super show, and I speak at every super show. Um, and and I love I love that I love that martial art. Uh, um, I just I love being around those that many martial. They're such a good bunch. I mean, like I, I, my, it's my, it's what I do. I mean, it's my favorite thing. I love being around people, talking shop and stuff like that. I love being able to to interview people because everybody has like their own story and their own way of looking at things. And I think that every time I get an opportunity to talk to a mar another martial artist, whether it be just somebody who just started or somebody who's been in the game for a, quite a while, um, they all have a different perspective, and it always makes me reevaluate how I look at things. You know, it's like, well, maybe I've been looking at it wrong. Maybe they do have a better viewpoint than I do. And it only makes me grow. So I love to go yeah. there and talk to some of these people and see, catch up with people too, you know? Like, but I hope yeah. I can go next year. I'd love to go. I'd love to cover the event. Um, like I co just covered EBI. So I had a camera crew come out and we like shot and recorded and stuff like that to cover the event. But I'm not like making fun of them. You know, I'm just covering yeah. it. It's information, you know? Yeah. He, out there. They did not like my, oh, somebody asked, no, when he fought Ch uh, Al Alistar Overeem, um, Chuck fought Alistair over him. Alistair over him could barely make 200 pounds. He was like 199. He could barely make 190. They fought at light heavyweight. Really? I, I yeah. can't that. Over him looks like a giant guy. He was like, he was, he was very tall and very, very skinny. He, he, he made, I guess they fought at 205, but he was like, un, he was like, I don't know, 203 or something. So, oh. I mean, he was light. And, uh, well, so is Chuck. Then that's when Chuck was. So they were both right around 203, 204. And yeah. now over. So they fought it light heavy. Somebody's asking if they fought it heavy. No, they did not fight it heavy. They so he beat, yeah, he beat over him, but it was at uh, light heavy. Yeah. All right. But, well, yeah, um, yeah. You know, I really appreciate you coming on, man. Like, I, I always think it's interesting to get people's different points of view and stuff like that. Now, I always ask the same question, no matter who it is, because it's my favorite stories to hear. But I do have a quick question for you. So. My favorite stories to hear from people are stories about things that have happened in the dojo, like what's happened, like, you know, somebody came in, challenged someone so to a fight, or, you know, somebody came in and they were crazy and they did something weird or whatever. Do you have anything like that that pops out in your head, like a good story from the dojo? It'd be like 500. <laughs> Don't forget, I've been, do I've been doing this since 1970. Um, <laughs> oh, I I'm sure in the 70s it was way better stories. Oh, honestly. my God. There was like... There was like when Cecil Peoples, the guy that did uh, Kumite, I forget his name. There was that, uh, who was that guy that did Kumite? Remember that movie? Frank Dukes. Yeah. He had a school near Cecil's and he put like, um, he put flyers on Cecil's dojo in the window. Like, come to a real school, come learn real martial arts. And it was his school. What? And, and I get a call that Cecil and I were like this. He, I get a call like uh, one morning. He goes, "Hey, I just came to my dojo, man. They they put all these signs up. Let's go down there and get them." And I was like, "Okay." So we <laughs> actually went. We went to Frank Duke's ninjutsu school, and they were just starting a class. And we like walked in, and they were teaching a class. And we go, "Where's Frank Duke's?" And it was like an old school a dojo war. I was like, "Where's Frank Duke's?" And Frank Duke's was nowhere around. He no, he's not here. And some guy was teaching. He goes. And we had all the signs, and it was like, I swear to God, we like, so we ripped up all these flyers, and we threw them on, during, right in the middle of this poor guy's class. It wasn't Frank Dukes, he was really, probably some kid that was just teaching there. And we ripped up all these flyers, you say, tell them Cecil People and John Hackam were here. And we threw all these, uh, these papers, and we walked out. <laughs> That's one. Another one, you remember Joe Lewis? Yeah, dude, yeah. Joe so, Lewis. so I was training with Benny, and Joe Lewis was there and he wanted, I think he had another fight come up or he wanted to do some kind of fight. So he came to, he was at the jet center and, and he wanted to spar. And it's like, Benny was like, all right, I got this guy Hackleman over here. He's a little lighter than you, but you know, he'll spar with you. And I was like, so he calls, he calls me over. He goes, yeah, this guy, you know, he's, you know, Joe Lewis. And I, I've heard of him before, but I wasn't, I didn't really follow him that much, you know, but I knew he was like a badass. And I was like, he's like, okay, I want you to show him what the jet center is all about. So I was like, all right. So I sparred Joe Lewis, but he's already a little tough. tough as, he's tough as shit. Yeah. But he wasn't good at leg kicks. And, oh, okay. And he got done. I capitalized on that quickly. And uh, <laughs> because he hit, he hit really hard. 
Yeah. So, um, so we sparred a little. I hit him with a couple of leg kicks. I ended up, he ended up, I ended up cutting him with like a left hook or something. He had to stop and go get stitches, and and that was my that was my like thing with him. But um, so there was that. There's there's been there's been okay. See, uh, uh, when uh, Chuck Chuck had this guy, and I never remember his name, but he won the Olympic gold medal light heavyweight boxing. Um. And then he, he moved up to like cruiserweight and he was like in town. And I, I live in a small town, but this guy, he was like dating a girl that lived in this town and they were gonna get married. And he was this boxer. Um, so he came to our gym to spar cause he had a fight coming up. And I was like, all right, bro, I got this guy, Chuck. He's, that's when Chuck was an amateur kick. He wasn't even a pro kickboxer yet. So I was like, well, I got this amateur. You've had like 400 fights. Um, I got this guy that's had, you know, maybe five amateur kickboxing matches. So he'll spar with you. But I'm telling you right now, do not take advantage of him or you will get hurt. And he was like, oh, man, okay, okay. Um, so he started sparring with Chuck and they started moving. But then his manager was like yelling shit, like, you know, like, like, aggressive stuff like basically telling him to go get go get him and they were just sparring so yeah, just tap and down. i already told chuck if if i give you a signal i want you to take him down and this guy was the boxer he didn't, he didn't know what a takedown was you know um and it, and our and our we didn't have a mat it was that back then the boxing our our sparring area was on a a, a wooden boxing floor that my dad had built so it was a box, it was a wooden floor. Yeah, it had a little spring to it. So so this guy started, like, going really hard with, with Chuck. And I was like, I was like, why the fuck's he doing that? Chuck's an amateur kickboxer. This guy's a pro a pro boxer who's, you know, winning a, t a world title. So I gave Chuck the signal. And Chuck ran in, double-legged him, slammed him on the ground. Um, and he, like, he sprained something. Uh, got up and he was limping and, and he had a fight coming up. And it was like, so he had to pull out of his fight. I told his manager, I said, bro, I told you guys, if you try to go hard with with my guy, we're going to hurt you. And you you took advantage of that. So sorry. They never came back. I never heard from that guy again. And, and well, anyway, so see, that was the story. It's always like anytime I ever go into somebody else's gym, right? Because that's something I have to be much more careful about now. Back in the day, I didn't have to worry about that because no one knew who the fuck I was. But like now, if I walk into somebody's gym, there's two things that they think. Either I'm there to call them out, so they want to hurt me, or they're like, oh, well, that guy in the dojo life, we never see him train. Let's, let's, let's see what he's all about. And they try to hurt me. So like no matter where I go now, everyone just tries to hurt yeah, me. Yeah, you got target on your back, bro. You I got just, a target on your back. I do, man. It's like I just can I not just train? Can I? Is it okay if I just roll? Like come <laughs> like, to the pit, come uh, to the pit and and mock my guys, like my fight team, and tell them you're fucking McDojo. This is not a real school. This is a McDojo. <laughs> yeah, see, I don't do that. <laughs> I call out. You know, I just told you my five rules, man. <laughs> I know. It'd be, it'd be funny as shit. It'd be funny. <laughs> Although my that guys was pretty funny. My guys, because my guys. My guys know, and I, because I, I bring this up a lot about McDojo's, and I've been using the word, the term McDojo for a long time. Yeah, it's been around forever. Yeah, and I, I, I just, I'm so against it, and I love it. I love it to watch, but the fact that they're teaching people to, to defend their life, they're going to get people killed. That's why I get so angry about it and so passionate about it, and yeah. you do too. Oh, yeah. It's because they're, they're, it's like, to me, it's like giving, it's like if you're in the army and your sergeant gives you an M16 full of blanks and then sends you out to the war to fight. Mm. To me, that's what it's like. It's to me that's what it compares to, and, and that's why it makes me so angry. It's like you're you're sending people out and they're going out with blanks and and and, and thinking they have real bullets, so they're going to go into a predicament where they're just not going to do well with blanks. Yeah, and it's a slap to the face for people who actually had to earn it, you know? I, I had to get my ass beat. I had to do the hard training. I had to make sure I was in shape. I had, you know, and then there's, there, here comes Captain Diabetes here, and he, he waddles his way into his classroom, and he outweigh, he's overweight by 200 pounds, and he starts teaching this, like, no-touch voodoo. Like, the, oh, God, oh, 
So I just got done. I went, I told you I was in LA, right? Yeah. And I went and did this Tai Chi seminar. And I'm not downing all Tai Chi because I don't know shit about all Tai Chi. I only know about the seminar I took with the people that I took it with. We stood in one place, one spot for two and a half hours, did not do a drill with another human being. All we did was stand there. The most that we did was raise our arms and lower them. That was the entire seminar. I was there for two and a half hours in the hot sun and was not sweating. Two and a half hours. And then two and a half hours in, the guy looks at us and he goes, all right, guys, we got about another four hours of the seminar to go. Do you just go and grab some water? And I was like, fuck that. <laughs> I was like, my back hurts because we haven't moved. I was like, I think I'm going to be out. I should just hang and I left. But, oh, man, some of the crazy stuff that comes out of this dude's mouth. But I think it's, it's ridiculous and it's eye-opening because – I always made fun of it, right, because it's ridiculous. But I always wondered, like, what's the mentality of the student to allow themselves to go that far? And now that I've taken a couple of these classes and recorded it, I'm starting to kind of get it now. It's because these people are really charismatic. They're, like, really yeah. charismatic. They could sell yeah. you pretty much anything, I'm sure. But this is the, the item that they're choosing to sell you is bullshit. And the way that they talk, they build this make-believe structure. Like, you know, for like boxing, it might be jab, cross, hook, whatever, right? But for them, they don't say that. They say, make sure you empty your leg instead of saying simple shit like picking up your leg. So they have like these key phrases and words that they use to make it a little seem a little bit more like, oh, there's something really here because I've never heard of that term. And you have to teach me what that term is. Well, now, every time you say it, you're the only person I've ever heard say it. It has to be true because you made it up. You know what I'm saying? I'd like if I said, all right, this is blue, right? You may have never seen the color blue in your life, right? You don't know that blue exists, but then I tell you, hey, I'm the expert. This is blue. And you go, oh, well, okay. So now for the rest of your life, you walk around like a dumbass going, oh, well, that's not white. That's blue. You know? It's like they, they brainwash you. They make up these terms, and then they teach you what the terms are, and then they say, this is, this is it. This is how There's you do the bunkai. it. There's the bunkai. <laughs> There's the bunkai right there, right? <laughs> Isn't that what it is? Uh, it's pretty good. It's pretty That's good. That's what the bunkai is. They're, yeah, they're, 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 and, and everything is is real because the bunkai they can say, well, it's this. If the guy was the guy was coming from the repelling from the, you never know. So, yeah. yeah, you need to come to the pit, bro. Uh, I'd love to, man. I'd love to train. Like, and it's really cool. Like, I might actually because I've been doing jujitsu for the last eight years. But yeah. I'm a third degree black belt in karate, and I haven't been able to wear my karate black belt in like eight years. Because <laughs> <laughs> so we do, we, our, our, our system's called Hawaiian Kempo. Mm. And I started Hawaiian Kempo back in 85. Uh, so that's my system. It's with an M, not an N. Um, yeah. So we have that. That's a street art. Hawaiian Kempo is for the street. Mm. Then I have my team, and they fight sport MMA. So it's an MMA. And then we have a BJJ course where we have a black belt BJJ guy and teaching that. And then we have CrossFit, which is like CrossFit only for martial arts. Yeah. And I actually started that with the owner of CrossFit back in 2003. And he came up with the term CrossFit. So, so I'm not like taking CrossFit and go putting a pit there and trying to, you know, he's the one that came up with that because he loved it so much that oh, okay. instead of all the, you know, the workout of the day, I, I had in like bag stuff and do this and do that. Yeah, that's so cool. Was, hey, let's let's call this CrossFit. Now, does so, it work the same way? Like, do you just go in and hit, like there's already something written up and you just handle it your own? This what? Well, like how CrossFit is, right? They have coaches there, but like typically with most CrossFit boxes, there's like a workout of the day, and yeah. you can go in at whatever time of day you want and you just do the workout. And yeah, the coach, there's a coach there. Is it kind of like no? That? Ours ours is run by classes and, and okay, and we have people on the bag. Because their workout of the day is sometimes five minutes. If they or they might do a Tabata four minute, that's the workout of the day. Yeah. And so some of their workouts are like fifteen minutes total. Mm. All our workouts contain warm up, bag work, and I always, to me, it's like fitness with a purpose because I want them mm. to know how to punch and kick and and do everything. So yeah, there's also it's also a course. Yeah, I'd love to go. Um, now it's I'm. I'm doing something pretty big coming up soon. I'm really looking forward to it. I'm uh, starting a website. And when my website drops, my ultimate goal is to have, like, uh, every school, Wait, every so martial that, arts no. studio. And, oh. I, mean, yeah, I can I barely it. hear. Yeah, it, just, it blipped for a second. Um, but uh, can you hear me? 
Okay, go. Yeah, there you go. So uh, my goal for the website is to have a map on there, and it's going to have literally every martial arts studio that I could possibly find in existence, and it'll have every detail about that studio ever. So it'll have oh, yeah? like, their lesson plans, their classes, who their instructors are, any news articles that have ever been written at, about them, whether it's good or bad, any reviews that you can find on them, and they'll have like a rating system based off of those things, you know, because anybody, any, any other school or studio can walk in and give you a negative review, right? Well, like you can't like write a negative news article about something that doesn't exist, right? So like, for instance, there's a dude who owns a uh, three martial arts studios somewhere in the Midwest, but he was a convicted pedophile. He like, uh, he got charged twice for uh, molesting two children. And uh, when, he got, when he got charged for molesting the kids, um, oh, if you're having a hard time hearing me, just swipe up and swipe back down, and it should, like, fix it. Okay. So, yeah, so if you, like, swipe up, swipe down, it should fix the, the audio. It's not that, working. That, so, but, um, yeah, but this dude, he, um, oh, yeah. there you go, better, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it happens, like, little Instagram <laughs> tricks. But, yeah, the, so the dude, he molested two kids, and he owns three martial arts studios. And... Like, when you look him up, it's very hard to find the article if you just look up the school. So my goal with my website is when I put out all the information, it's literally every news article ever written about whatever martial arts studio is, period. Like, if they molested a kid, if, uh, if they, it was something good for the community, whatever it is. And based off of that publicity and their, uh, their reviews, it'll give them an overall, overall rating, a realistic rating about what type of martial arts studio it is. If they do katas, it'll be listed there. If they charge for belt testings, it'll be listed there. If their instructor has a lineage, the lineage will be listed, and it'll have all of the studio's information. So you'll have one place to go to actually look up real information about the studio. Because the average student, the only question they know to ask is how much. Well, that's, that's like the dumbest fucking question ever. Like, I understand you can only afford so much, but at the same time, like, there are far more important questions to ask. Because if you're going to be doing martial arts and really do it, you're going to be doing it for a couple of years. You know what I'm saying? If you're really doing it, it's going to take you a couple of years to like work through it. So you're like years. a Yelp. You're like a Yelp? Kind of like a Yelp, but the only difference is Yelp is all based off of people's reviews. Right. I'm going to be basing our reviews off of facts. So What's, the, they, what's, the, they, what's the theater one? Like the popcorn when you look at oh, the Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Rotten Tomatoes. So you're something like that. Somebody's yeah. asking CrossFit. Uh, first of all, do I kip? Sometimes, but like CrossFit, they teach you to work out and that's your working out to work out. So they're teaching you how to, how to do better pull-ups. At the pit, the difference between CrossFit and CrossFit is we do pull-ups in case we got to pull somebody. It's all for martial arts. Our goal is always martial arts. So uh, we don't want to do better pull-ups. We want to have a better pulling. So we don't care about kipping. You can kip or not. We don't really care because our goal is be a better martial artist. And when you say did um, you started CrossFit, you start no. Glassman and I got together because we we're both doing, we we're both kind of near each other and we we're both training really hard. So he was doing CrossFit, I was doing the pit. So he didn't get the name CrossFit from me or the idea. He, he got that idea. My stuff was all martial arts. So when I brought my martial arts into his CrossFit, then we decided to make cross pit. Somebody yeah. was asking that. Yeah. So anyway, I got to rush to class though, brother. Oh, I hey, gotta man. Go teach. Uh, real fast before you go. Um, I'm not sure if you had anything that you'd like to plug or tell people, um, but how can they get a hold of you? How can they find out more about your stuff? What's your Instagram? All that stuff. I think, I think the best way to do it is just pit underscore master. Cause I, I focus mainly on Instagram. Now I do a lot of Facebook uh, and that's just uh, uh, the pit master. But most of my stuff is, uh, you'll find a link. I always put links and stuff on Instagram just because there's too many things now. So almost everything I do is uh, Instagram, and it links to there. Cool. Well, hey, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate your time. Um, thank you. I love really what you do, brother. Can, love what you do. Again. Let's get together soon. You're always welcome to the pit. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. I can't wait. All right. Aloha, bro. All right. And I'm not a McDojo. You're not, I know. <laughs> All right, bro, thanks. Catch you later. All right, man. That was a good time. Uh, John Hackleman, awesome dude.